Hello, security pros. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today on ESA's webinar. Today, we are talking about financial fundamentals for business leaders of systems integrators. In this webinar, we will address how the building blocks of good project accounting practices roll up to the income statement in order to understand the financial contributions of your functional role to the overall success of the business. I'm Daniela Chavez, ESA's Marketing and Communications Specialist, and I'm excited to lead this webinar today. Before we dive in though, I would like to provide some tips for those of you joining us on your first ESA webinar. You will be muted for the duration of the session, but that doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. If a question or comment comes to mind at any point during today's session, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and I'll ensure that we save some time for your questions with our experts today. We will also be recording this webinar, so you can re-watch the on-demand session on our YouTube channel and share it with your colleagues. Tomorrow, you will also receive an email thanking you for your attendance today with a link to the recording. If your company is a member of ESA, we thank you, and we hope you're utilizing your benefits to save, expand your team, and get connected to the ESA community. If you're not yet a member of the Electronic Security Association, check us out. ESA is the largest and longest standing association serving the pro-installed electronic security and live safety industry. Our members are integrators, dealers, monitoring centers, and even manufacturers and service providers in the space. You'd be surprised at the power an ESA membership holds for your company. Get a feel for all the ESA benefits, including savings on business insurance, training, customized in-house onboarding, and professional development programs, as well as peer networking groups, government advocacy programs, certifications that satisfy state licensing, and in some cases are also alternatives to NYSET at esaweb.org. One of our membership specialists would be happy to walk you through these benefits and the application process. We at ESA realize your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending some of that time with us today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Joel Harris. Joel is an experienced executive across multiple industries with extensive experience leading, building and growing low voltage companies from security to audiovisual, to structured cabling, to special, specialty healthcare. Over the past 20 years, Joel led company growth by tenfold through equal parts of organizational improvement, strategic transformation, and multiple acquisitions as COO and CEO. Joel currently serves as the president of Solutions 360 and leads Navigate Management Consultants, Financial Planning, Management Planning, and Strategic Ad. So without further ado, Joel, please take it away. Thanks, Danielle. So really happy to be here and excited to talk about what might be a bit of a boring conversation for most of us. I'll try to keep the energy up. Actually, this 45 minutes is codified or shortened down from about a six hour class that I teach. So it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. There's a lot of content here. I'll try to go slow enough to make it make sense. At the same time, we'll go from the very broad uh, constructs of consulting or accounting down to two very specific applications that I hope you'll be able to take away uh, for in, and deploy in, in your business today. As Danielle said, I'm president of Solutions 360. We build specialized project accounting software uh, for this industry and a workflow application. But whether you use our system or not, the principles we're gonna talk today are germane and applicable to every one of your businesses. I started life out as an engineer and as an engineer, I viewed accounting with great skepticism. I thought it was really just bad math and uh, not very sophisticated math at that. Later on, I went back and got my MBA and, re and realized that finance and accounting is the, is the language of business. And if you don't speak the language, you're always going to be a little bewildered uh, in the business uh, dialogue that you're having with your bank, with your partners, and even with your customers. And so we see accounting as a tool to be used to help us run better businesses. And I hope that's the spirit you'll join uh, with me today. I'm not a CPA. I'm, I'm not an accountant. I'm uh, just a business person who uses accounting tools to help run a better business. And I hope that's the uh, attitude that all of us have uh, in the seminar today. So with that, let's start at the very basics. So uh, you may have heard this, accounting is organized into three separate financial statements. The first 
is how do we manage our assets and liabilities? What do we own and what do we owe? And that's listed on the balance sheet. A balance sheet is a point in time uh, listing of the things that we own and the things that we owe. We measure our business performance through something called the income statement. You might also have heard it called the profit and loss statement or PL statement. And that covers a period of time. So for a month or a quarter or a year, we summarize the business activities over that period of time to give us an idea of our profitability for or lack thereof of the entire business. And then finally, we have our cash flow statement that shows how we're managing cash. Obviously, when we buy things, we don't immediately put them on a job. Or when I, when I have payroll and pay that, I don't immediately charge the customer for that. So we have something in accounting called the accrual-based system. And the accrual mat allows me to match revenues and expenses, even though they don't match the cash flow. So cash flow ties together all the elements of our business activities. Because at the end of the day, and I'll repeat this more than once, cash is king. And without cash, we don't have a sustainable business. So cash flows, although we don't use them very much in the day-to-day -day management of our companies, is an incredibly important aspect to understand that underlines the accounting uh, fundamentals. So with that, let's take a little deeper dive into each of these. All three of these statements are intertwined. So none of them operate on their own. They are um, tied together. So on the balance sheet, what the company owns and owes is used to generate the business, your inventory, your vehicles, the um, uh, borrowing that you're doing from the bank, that we use to generate business. And the business is then managed or the performance of the business is shown on the income statement. And this is the one that most of us use most of the time, um, but it doesn't show the complete picture of our company health, it shows the picture of our performance of the company's business. What's our sales, what's our expenses, and what is our profits? Profits are returned to the shareholders, the owners of the business, and that's shown on the balance sheet. Uh, intertwined with both of those statements are our cash flow because cash moves in and out of balance sheets and cash moves in from revenue uh, paid as when paid by customers and out through expenses when used for payroll or to buy equipment for our projects. So these three financial statements are intertwined to give us the whole picture. With that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this key concept of the difference between profitability and liquidity. Profitability is a measure of our business success. How well is a company performing over time? But it doesn't tell us what our cash reserves are. And so you can run a very profitable company, but if you're in the midst of your profit, you deplete your cash and you have payroll due next week, and you can't pay it, you're out of business. And so liquidity is an important factor to understand. It's the cash position of the company and how liquid is the company to meet its short-term obligations. And so managing or balancing both of those, the profitability of your company, as well as the liquidity of your company is an important fact to understand whether you're a salesperson, an operations manager, a technician, a technical engineer, or the owner of the business. And all too often, we spend our time on the profitability and we, we, we are negligent on our management of the cash of our business. Um, too many of our businesses are banks for our customers and we really need to move out of that position so that we can maintain our liquidity to continue to serve our customers better. I want to look at our profit and loss statement. Most people are very familiar with this format. The first section is our revenue. That's how, as we deliver uh, projects and services, we recognize revenue. So this is not our sales. Our sales are booked orders from customers. Booked orders as we perform the job turn into revenue through those activities. So um, placing equipment on the job, installing that equipment, our t &Ms from service, our box sales, our service contracts. As we perform work um, based on the contract we have with our customers, we generate this thing called revenue. As we generate revenue, we consume expenses to perform that. We use labor, uh, subcontract or internal. We make the payroll. We have vehicles. We have uniforms. We have training. We have parts and pieces that go on the jobs. We use subcontractors. We pay for freight um, to get material in and to ship it to our customers. 
And that's known in, on the accounting statement as cost of goods sold, COGS. So cost of goods sold, or what does it cost for us to actually deliver the revenue uh, that we have, uh, that we're generating? That equals something in, that's very important on the income statement, which is called our gross profit. The percentage of revenue is called gross margin, often are intertwined. You'll hear people talk about gross profit or gross margin, like they're one and the same. Gross profit is a dollars, gross margin is a percentage. But it's an intermediate step to your final net number because after you've covered your project costs, you then have to pay for all the overhead of the organization, the commissions, the payroll, the benefits, the rent, the insurance, the marketing expense, the list goes on and on. And that's called SGNA, sales and general and administrative expenses. Once you subtract that overhead from your project costs, you're left with the net profit. Way too many of our companies spend their time obsessing over gross profit, which they should, but they don't, uh, they don't spend enough time obsessing over the overhead costs that lead to net profit. And we're going to spend most of our time, uh, if you're part of our organization, talking about how do we drive revenue into net profit while we measure the interim stepping stone of gross profit along the way. But gross profit does not tell you the full story. Net profit tells you the full story of your company. So we want to talk a little bit about this thing called the line. Some of you have heard about, is it above the line or below the line? And the line is simply where gross profit um, is separated from sales general and administrative expenses. So if we have revenue and we subtract out our cost of goods sold, often an allocated number, uh, that equals our gross profit. That gross profit then becomes the line that separates the overhead and the bottom line, which is net profit. And so the most important line is not whether it's above or below the line. The most important line for you to think about from your accounting perspective is whether or not your bottom line is positive. And lastly, we're going to talk real quickly about cash flow statements. Cash flow statements just report the overall liquidity and the flow of money in and out of the company. So inflows could be on uh, revenue and uh, uh, from customers. Um, it could also include in external investment sources um, if you're in need of a liquidity injection. It also shows the outflow. So the things that pay for the expenses of the business activities and any investments the company might make. It's often broken into operations, investing and financing, not all that important. What's really important is if you're not in, in the habit of forecasting a cash flow for your company, and understanding whether or not you'll have enough cash to, to sustain the business operations, you need to get in the habit and talk to your accountant about it and understand that a cash flow forecast is one of the most important business tools that you can have in running your business. And, and all management should be involved in this, not just the finance team, the head of sales, the head of technical operations, the head of your uh, engineering all the executive management should understand the importance of, of, your, of your cash position in running the business. So all three are, are essential. I hope that you give this kind of very, very brief overview of the three working parts of the income statement or the financial statements has been helpful to you because projects consume cash to purchase equipment and make payroll. Now, as I said earlier, we don't want to be the bank for our customers where we spend and spend and spend and hope for one day get a check in from our customers. So a lot of us have policies around getting deposits from our customers so that we can spend their cash in doing their projects instead of our own cash and having to borrow from the bank. So a deposit uh, idea is an important one for you to consider if you're not in the habit of collecting deposits. There are some industries and some um, contractual situations where deposits are not allowed. And so you have to understand then how to cash flow your business in order to stay, stay in business while you serve those customers if they are the ones you choose to serve. Then well-run projects can yield profitability. Notice I say can because sometimes projects don't and of themselves become profitable. Um, and so the difference between revenue and expenses is the profitability. That profitability is shown on the income statement. 
the things that go in to drive the profitability, the inventory balance, the accounts receivables, what customers owe you, accounts payables, what you owe your vendors are shown on the balance sheet. So I can have a profitable company, have profitable projects that are showing profitability for the company, but I can have a negative cash position based on how um, my balance sheet is, uh, is shoring up those projects. So the cash flow to fund the projects and receive from customers is shown in your cash flow statement. The bottom line is the companies cannot grow or fund projects without cash. Profit alone is not, does not determine a successful company, but cash is only generated from profits. So therefore, we have to run profitable companies in order to generate cash in order to be a sustainable um, and ongoing business concern. So cash is king. This is something that if you've been in business at any time along, you've heard quoted as the all-in statement, and yet very few companies really understand what it means to have cash is king. Businesses cannot understand, cannot survive without an understanding of the cash flow of their business. So if you don't understand how your business turns business operations into cash, that an essential take home from you is to go figure that out for your business. Profitability generates cash. As would be obvious, losses consume cash. So for most companies, we focus appropriately on how the company generates profit as reflected in the income statement. But this is a warning to say that a focus only on profitability um, might eventually one day run out of, of cash, which is the oxygen to your business. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that profitability. Most companies focus first on their expense. So they say, okay, I've got this much payroll I got to cover. I've got, I owe this much to the bank. I have. And so I take my expenses and I say, how much do I have to sell in order to cover those expenses? And then lastly, I hope to eke out a profit if I'm doing a good enough job. This is a very poor planning model. Um, there's a better way. I really like the book by Mike Michalowicz called Profit First. And in his book, he has this new accounting formula, which says we should plan our sales. We should then plan our profit we want from our sales. And then we should work really hard to make sure that our expenses do not exceed the remaining amount. This is a very simple idea that your parents taught you as children, at least my parents taught me, which is every time I earned a dollar, my instruction in life was to save first and spend second. So every time I would make a quarter working for my dad for an hour, the question was, how much are you saving? And then whatever's left over, you can spend. We as business owners would be way better off to apply this um, instruction to our businesses that we received as children from our parents. So in the financial presentation, we start with revenue, we pay for our project equipment, we pay for our project labor that leaves us our gross profit, we pay for our expenses that leaves the profit. And because of the way we present this on our accounting and income statements, it tends to lead us to think that profit is what is left over. And what Mike is trying to teach us to do is to say that no, we need to plan differently than we report on this. The planning is how much revenue can we expect how much profit do we want to generate out of that revenue? Then I got to pay for my equipment. I got to pay for my labor. And I cannot afford to spend anything more for SGNA than what's left over. So our spending is after our profit, aka our savings from our revenue. If you'll adopt this mindset, I promise you, you'll, you'll, you'll think about how to run a more profitable business instead of thinking about what are my expenses? How much revenue do I have to have? And then how am I going to eke out a profit? Protect the profit as sacrosanct first on every dollar of revenue you do, and you'll run a very successful business. Thanks for letting me be on my soapbox about this. I'm very passionate about uh, running profitable companies um, that are sustainable for the future for the behalf of our customers and our colleagues. So that is the big picture. I'm going to transition now into project accounting because if you're in a project-based business, is you must have a great project accounting system. You don't need to use ours, but you better have a really good one because the building block for accounting and financial reporting is the project. If I don't accurately assign costs to a project, 
and track my performance on a project level basis, I will never ever get to the bottom of why I am running a successful project business or not. I might be successful through luck, but it won't be because I understand what's going on. So it's a critical that we understand what goes into making the costs of a project. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is to stop playing games about where do you record expenses, this whole above the line and below the line nonsense that so many people fall in love with. It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, all expenses have to be paid in order to generate profit. What really matters is our net profit. And there's only two buckets in the general income statement that really go into making this, and that's our cost of goods sold, our COGS, and our SGNA. What I find in consulting with our customers is that when I create exposure to the cost of goods, that is, I move that cost up into something that I'm measuring against a project, it gets managed, and it should be managed. SGNA expenses have to be controlled, as we said earlier. They're really what's left over for me to spend after my project profitability. One of the things I see way too often is people decide, well, I'm not going to put that up in COGS because I don't. I like to pretend I have a bigger gross margin or gross profit dollar than I have because everybody talks to me about gross profit and they want to know my gross margin is 30% or 35 or 40. And boy, it sounds good when I go to industry seminars. And I can able to talk about how big my gross profit is. For an industry that averages 2 to 4% net income, that is absolutely nuts. We need to be worried. I'd far rather you have a 15% gross profit, but, but, but have a 10% net profit than for you to go around bragging that you have a 40% gross profit, but you're only generating 2% net profit. Move the costs up in the COGS because they get actively measured and tracked. And now I know what I'm really spending. Some popular examples, and we'll come to this over and over again in the seminar, people don't charge engineering time. Engineering is an overhead. Why? Because they're salaried. That's nuts. Engineering time to a project should be applied to a project. Project manager time to a project should be applied to a project. Project coordinator time applied to a project should be applied to a project. All the time, all the reasons that you might give yourself an excuse for not applying it to the project are simply not valid. Track all the costs to the project doesn't matter the label. So forget listening to your accountant and what they might call it as variable or fixed cost, indirect or direct costs, hourly or salary. None of those labels matter as to whether or not the question is, if you're using it to generate project or service contract revenue, then what is the cost of that? And you need to track that. Some common misperceptions that I deal with as I consult across our industry. One is uh, a fear. If if people, when I tell people how to accurately cost a project, they're like, holy cow, well, I'll never be able to make the margin I expect on that. I'll never be able to sell it for that. So I'd rather lie to myself and pretend my costs aren't real because I can't sell it for that. Well, the reality is if you continue to undersell your, under cost your projects, one day you'll go out of business. So don't let this be a far greater fear of going out of business than whether or not you can sell it. Once you know your true costs and you know the market opportunity, then you know whether it's worth staying in business or not. Until you have facts about what it really costs you to run your project, you're operating in a delusional world. Second is um, we have this ego. I talked about this earlier. People want to brag about their gross margin. Well, if you got to brag about something, brag about your net profit, until then, don't really worry about it. Gross profit is an essential thing to manage, but only if you have all of the costs in it. If you're busy hiding costs that you can brag, then you're making bad business decisions. And speaking of bad business decisions, sometimes because our commission plans are set based on the gross profit that we generate, we then let our commission plans dictate what we put in or don't put in the cost. Again, that is nuts. We should absolutely have accurate costing. And if something needs to change, then we need to change our commission plans to reflect the reality of what our projects cost us. And finally, there's the old, we never did it that way. Well, uh, I would encourage you to not go out of business just because you never did it that way, but instead investigate the costs of it. So in a, pro in a project business, the key accrual accounting concept is to match revenue to expenses. 
And so the core building block for financial reporting is the project or service contract. We start with that. That's the building block. We're not running a manufacturing line where we sell 10,000 widgets. We're not running a retail operation where I'm, I'm, I'm selling pieces of, of, of inventory. We're running a project and the project has equipment and labor associated with it. Revenue by general accepted accounting principles, GAAP, is, determined, is, is generated as we perform work on that. So my revenue is, is determined by the work that I perform on a project. So all costs have to be reported to that project. It doesn't matter. Here's one of the things that really irritate me. When I talk to clients, I say, well, the customer doesn't want to see that in the proposal. The customer doesn't want to pay for it on an invoice. It doesn't matter how we present it to the customer because we incur the costs, whether or not we tell the customer that we're incurring those costs or not. Sales time, I mean, I'm sorry, pre-sales engineering time or project management time or all the other things that people want to leave out of because the customer doesn't want to see that as a line item doesn't mean that we shouldn't be costing. In fact, we have to cost them to the project in order to understand the true cost of those projects. So regardless of whether you detail it out as a specific equipment component or not, say for example, consumables, cables, connectors, um, access cards, whatever you're, you're putting into your, your overall project cost, they have to be costed to the project so that you know your true cost of the project. At in our company, we have this idea that how we estimate should be how we plan our projects, should be how we report on our projects, and should be how we deliver on our projects not how we propose it or invoice it. We can put all kinds of presentation layers on our proposals and our invoicing, but behind the scenes, we should be estimating accurate costs. We should be tracking actual costs and we should be reporting on those actual costs. Then we know whether we're running a healthy business or not. And because of that, I'm now gonna really get on my soapbox and talk about the two key activities that you have to get right in a project-based business. Number one, you have to track your costs. And this is, in most of our business, time. So our time, our payroll, as it's used to our projects, is the most important contribute, contributing factor to understanding the true profitability of our projects. So all project teams must record actual time for the project. Doesn't matter if your salary or hourly, if you spend an hour on a project, record an hour of the project. Doesn't matter if you add activity, if you think the activity adds value or not. You record, if you spend time on the project, you record time. I've had project managers tell me over the years, oh, that's just an administrative activity. I can't charge that to the project. Well, I'm paying you to manage that project. And if what is needed is an administrative hour, then you have to charge that administrative hour to the project. And so we have to understand all the costs that go into it. The litmus test is, can, if I can't do this project without that person or that piece of equipment, then my time should, is recorded to the project. And so if a person is essential to the success of a project because of what they're doing to contribute to the project, their time has to be recorded to the project. The second thing that we do a historically poor job of in, our, in this industry is not tracking scope changes. All projects evolve. It is a very, very rare, if not never case where a project does not evolve from the time the salesperson sells it and you get the order in to the time that project was delivered. Something is going to change about that project. And so you have two basic changes. You have the customer requested change, which we call a customer change order. And we have something where we messed up in quoting the job, and that's an internal change order to deliver it. Both have to be tracked. All the costs associated with change orders have to be tracked against that project. You can have a customer requ request a change order that you decide to give them for zero price. That's okay. But it doesn't mean that it, doesn't have zero, that, that it has zero cost to you. If it has a cost to you, regardless of whether you charge the customer or not, you have to create a change order. The customer versus company is simply an allocation of, of, of responsibility of who, who made that decision. And so even if you get in the habit of giving change orders away to your customers to placate them or retain them or whatever excuse you have in your head about why you would do that, please, please, please track the cost to that change order. The other thing about tracking is we have to do tracking along the way. 
finding out that we lost the game because we didn't keep score until after the game is over is a poor way to play a game. We have to track our profitability or the score along the way, not just at the end. So some simple guidelines for that is we have to post our project hours weekly. Have a known cutoff for your company. All hours against the project have to be done on Monday. We should run project reports so that every week when you have your job performance meeting, you're looking at actual hours suspended against that project so you know where you are. Project managers should update the estimate to complete. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide more. And project managers have to review or own all the hours. If you have random people charging hours to the project, how in the world can you hold your project managers accountable for the, pros for the profitability or the performance of the project? And so you have to know the profitability of your projects along the way. Not a surprise ending. If you don't know this, you will never get control of your project costs. And project-based businesses must forecast. So here's the piece that um, a lot of companies miss. They might do a really good job of tracking. They might do a really good job of getting all the time onto a project, but they don't estimate what it's actually going to take to complete a project. When I meet with clients and I ask them, uh, what's your status? They tell me, well, I've spent 15 hours on my budget of 30, so I'm at 50%. That is probably not anywhere close to true because it's very unlikely that the amount of time you spend on a project represents the true performance of that project. You could be ahead. In other words, you could only have five more hours to go, in which case you're not 50% uh, completed, just you're 90% um, completed. Or you could have 30 more hours remaining. You've already spent 15, but you have 30 to go. You're not when you're close to 50%. I um, guess on my math here, you're 33% completed. And so where, what I have spent is not a reliable indicator of the performance of the project. What matters is how much is it going to take to finish the project. So if you, can, if you could take away one of many things I'm, I'm going to be talking about in this, in your accounting programs, to have a great accounting system, you must be able to forecast the amount of time remaining to complete the task, not just how much you've spent on it. First, you have to have everyone assign all their time to the projects. Second, you have to measure it on a weekly basis so you know your profitability along the way. But third, you have to have the discipline to know what, how much further. When I was a kid and I'd wear right in the back of my dad's woody station bag and across the United States, I never asked my dad, how far have we come? The cries from the five kids in the back of the car always was, how much further? How much further? Are we there yet? How much further? The question that you as business owners and project managers should always be asking of yourself is how much further do we have to go? That is the accurate representation of the progress on your project, not how much you've spent. Because the sooner you know you are projecting more than a budget spend, the sooner you can plan a solution. Most of us are very, very good at adjusting and adapting if we know that we're running out of runway to get the plane into the ground or get the project completed. Give your teams the ability to help improve profitability by giving them visibility into the metric that matters, and that is how much further do we have to go to complete this project? Because once you have spent the budget, every single dollar you spend for a piece of equipment or consumable or labor dollar after that Go straight to the bottom line. You remind me, me, you remember me earlier saying, focus on the net profit, not on the gross profit. The minute you have overspent your budget, you're not impacting your gross profit anymore. You're impacting your net profit because it's coming straight off the bottom line. Every dollar that you're spending is a terrible position to be in and you should do everything you can to be forewarned of it, know it's coming and doing everything you can to prevent that from happening. So that all falls under one leg of the most important things we try to teach our customers and our clients in this industry, which is track your projects. The second one, though, is how much am I actually tracking? So I have an hour applied to the job. How much does that hour cost? And this is, goes into an area called burden, which is where I'm allocating things to a project that are not specific to that project but I can accurately assign to the project because the use of them across all my projects should equal 100% of their cost. A van, 
the tools that I'm using, the training that I'm getting. I don't get that specifically for job for job, but instead I allocate that based on an, a ratio to the labor dollars that I'm passing, and that's called burden. So for next thing, the next topic that we wanna talk about in our remaining time is how do we calculate the burden, which is all the costs that go with the labor. One of the things that we consistently see across our client base is that people underestimate burden. Somewhere along the way, they were told, well, burden should be 20% or 25% of your labor. That's baloney. That might cover taxes. That is about it. Might cover benefits, but it does not cover the cost of your labor in the field. You will lose money and you will go out of business because you're underestimating your costs on a project. Here's my example. A technician earns $25 an hour. So an annualized, forget over time, but just on an annualized rate, that's $52,000 a year in pay. Now, I also have to pay their taxes, their, their uh, FICA, their SUCA. Um, I pay for their health care, the liability, um, the training. And let's just, for example, say that comes up to $20,000 a year per person. That's in the range. So I'm, I'm out of pocket for that technician, $72,000 a year, whether I charge an hour of billable time to a customer or not. Regardless, my cost out of pocket is $72,000 for that employee and for each one of them that I have working on my staff. And I also give them some holidays and vacation and training time. And just for ease of number, let's, let's say that equals 30 days, not far off. So that's 240 hours of that 2,080 hours that they're available to work. So now their availability to work is only 1,840 hours. I can't bill them more than 1,840 hours. Now, the other thing we know is that because of scheduling, because of short work days, because some jobs take less than a full eight hour job, I can't schedule out perfectly all of my technicians, engineers, project managers, programmers, you name it. I can't schedule them out full, full. Even under a very, very busy work schedule, I'm generally pretty lucky if I can get them scheduled 80%. So 20% of hours of the available is 368 hours. That leaves me 1,472 hours of time I can bill to a project. So if I can only bill 1,472 hours to a project, what is my cost for that hour? And so the technician direct burden rate is $48.91. If you think about it as a multiplier, it's 1.96 multiplier or it's a 96% burden on top of your, sal or your, of your employee's salary. So when we get that number by taking that 72,000 and dividing it by the billable hours that they can work, you should do this for all your classes of wages. You don't do this per individual, you do this per class. You take all your junior techs and you put them in a pool, take the average, take your lead techs, put them in a pool, take the average, your programmers, your control people, your, um, uh, cable pullers, if you have them separated out by job class, your engineers, your project managers, um, take them and separate them out by job class, figure out the average wage, and then go through this exercise. But we haven't told the whole story yet. We've only told part of the story because on top of the direct labor that we put on jobs, we also have a whole bunch of people in the company that we have to pay for, our sales engineers, our administrative people, our management people, our procurement people, our warehouse people, our finance people. There's a whole host of people in our company that aren't performing revenue producing work. The only revenue that you have coming in from your comp from, for your company is your projects. Therefore, your projects have to cover the cost of everyone in the company, not just the person doing the job. And it has to cover all the company activities, meetings, administrative time, internal email, scheduling, the, the fuel and maintenance, the tools, the uniforms, all the things that we've talked about before. And so typically that equals 25 to 35% of the cost. And so when I add in indirect labor and overhead to on top of my technicians direct labor, uh, then it comes up to $63.58. It's a little precise, but we're just trying to get the math right here for those of you who uh, wanna follow along with this. And so the question then is, when I calculate my labor profit, how much did I make on that $63? So if I sold a $25 an hour technician at $60, I actually lost 6% on a fully burdened rate. At $75, I made 18%. At 
And at $90, I made 29%. So it takes me charging $90 an hour to make a 29% gross margin on a $25 hour payroll. I hope that none of you are stunned by these numbers, but in my experience, far too many of our uh, members in this, in this industry do not understand what it really takes to go into. So you have two things that you have to really work on, track all the time to the project and get it costed correctly in order to have a great project accounting system. Because the only profitability of profit is how much I sold these projects for. And so if that's my only source of profit, then I have to track all the labor hours at a full burden in order to understand whether or not I'm making money or not. Here's a rule of thumb I use with all my clients. Uh, and that is that the cost basis, how much should I charge to this project should be the average wage in the category multiplied by 2.5%. Now we at uh, Solutions360 have extensive spreadsheets that we can help send you. If you'd want one, uh, tag me after this call, be happy to send it to you because it's a worksheet that will do a bottoms up detailed review of this. If you case, and a lot of people don't believe me, even accountants don't believe me on this until they do their work themselves and they prove to themselves that they are under costing the amount of labor that goes on to their projects. And so we have the detailed uh, worksheets behind this, but if you don't have the time or you just wanna check your math, uh, just simply take the average wage category multiplied by 2.5 and then use that against your internal costing sheets to see how close or not you are fully costing your labor. The last thing I wanna cover is that I can show great project profitability, but if my projects don't consume all of the pool of labor and equipment that I've allocated, then it won't equal what I'm showing on my financial statements. So our total project PL should equal our financial PL gross profit line. But that only happens under perfect assumption. Remember, I said 80% utilization. Well, what happens if I had 85% utilization? What happens if I had 75% utilization? It's like a broken clock. It's right twice a day, but it's wrong every other time. So a very important metric for you to measure is your over under allocation. And it's very simple. You take all the hours billed to the project, you multiply it times your burden, your standard cost, you subtract all your total payroll and benefits of all the project team members and all the costs that go into it, like fuel and vehicles and depreciation. And if you cover all those costs, then, then that at, at equilibrium, a project accounting would equal PL. If not, then you can have either over or under. If you're under allocating, you're not covering the cost of your project team, which means you need to adjust your burden upright. If you have over allocation, then the opposite is true. You're over allocating, you're overburdening, and you can reduce your burden in order to reduce the cost. Now, this is something you should do over a period of time. In the summer, our industries are generally over allocated. And that is, I get better utilization because I'm just busy running all out. But in the winter, all of a sudden, I've got people cleaning out the warehouse. They're doing non billable activities. Now, I want to do it. I want them to do that because I want to keep them on my payroll. But I have to understand that I'm not being paid for payroll that's going out the door. So, the critical performance measure, if you don't have this today, is an over and under allocation within the time period. And don't get spooked if you're under, under it for a month or two, because that's very normal in winter months. Don't get uh, all excited if you're over allocating in the summer months. But across a year, that should net out to zero for you. Sometimes um, when I start lecturing on utilization, managers start pencil whipping their forms to show everybody's got great utilization. The problem with that, of course, is I'm not generating productivity for the labor hours that I'm applying to jobs. And so you have to have integrity in reporting and managers have to be committed to reporting actual hours to projects, to the projects they're working on and not play games and say, well, this project's over budget, so I'm not gonna record time. Instead, I'll I record time to this other project. You'll never understand where your money losers and makers are if you start playing games, just be real with yourself and show actual. So I'm gonna close with this. We never wanna confuse project and company profitability. I can show very profitable projects, but if in the end of the day, they don't drive the company profitability, then I'm missing a link. So again, I determine my project profitability by all of my equipments and using the concept of burden labor, that is 
all the company costs are spread across the pool of labor types and represented in a cost per hour. Company profitability is determined by the actual cost. So project profitability allocated, company profitability actual. And so the sum of all the costs from the projects must equal the sum of everything I'm stroking checks for. Everything I write a check for, I'll put that in a big pool and it has to equal the cost of the company. So there we are. We went from the sublime to the ridiculous. We went from the grand concepts of three parts of the, uh, the financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow, all the way down to two practical applications, track your time to projects, forecast to completion, and burden it correctly, and you'll run a successful integration business. With that, I'm going to ask my partner in crime, Matt Graham, who joins me on the call here, uh, to collect and uh, give a verbal Q&A for me of anything that I might have gone too fast or, or um, explained poorly through this webinar. Well, Joel, you must have been quite thorough today because there are none. <laughs> well, wait a, wait a few minutes to see if any trickle in, but... Well, that's not a good... Slate. Oh, Scott Wilson is raising his hand. Scott, can you find the Q&A section and type it in there? Hold on. I think I can allow him to talk. We also just did get a new Q&A question as well. Um, no, I'm going well, I'm, I'm to I'm gonna allow uh, Scott Wilson to talk here. He has his hand up. Thank you, Keith. Go ahead, Scott. Scott's muted. There he is. Can you hear me? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, that's fun. So I was just, I was actually hitting the chat box and it would not let me put in a statement. So I did not see the Q&A statement. I actually don't have a question. <laughs> All right, thanks, Scott. <laughs> Awesome. Keith, we appreciate your uh, your comment as well, buddy. So we have a question uh, from David. Um, Joel, if you're ready for one, what yeah. is a good net profit percentage target for an integration company? So that is a really good question. I'm going to give you my general stock answer, but uh, one of the things when I went to get my business degree, I thought like any engineer does that I was going to get a clear answer. And the, the answer in all business questions is it depends. So a lot of this depends on your mix of business, but I'm going to tell you that an integration company that's not achieving 10% net profit really ought to be investigating whether they should be in business or not. So my standard target for an integration company is 10% uh, net profit or return on sales as a target. Don't panic if you're not there. If you're 2%, figure out how to get to four, four, you get to have six, six to eight, eight to 10. If you're above 10, because you operate in some niche in the industry, then please don't devolve to 10. There are lots of companies who substantially outperform the 10%, but 10% is a good target uh, for me to think of starting about uh, starting a conversation around. Uh, if, uh, I think Daniela, our, our emails on the, can you get the audience, our email contact, and we'll be happy to send out the spreadsheets for anyone who wants those. Or Joel, yeah. just click to the, the next slide has some contact info. No, oh, I'm it's on me. Okay. Let me <laughs> try that. Um, we do have another Q and a question from Josh. Um, he asks, how would you integrate monitoring costs and project costs? Would you allow them to offset each other? I would probably never do that, Josh. It's a great question. Um, at the business level, we want to see the net income, right? So there's a lot of companies in our space, in the fire and alarm space, that do projects at you know low to break even margins in order to generate the monitoring uh, return, and that's a fine business strategy. But I wouldn't put them. I wouldn't combine them on the project basis. 
uh, certainly at the overall strategy level, you need to come. So I would want to know what my monitoring profitability was that was very separate from my project profitability and then make my own decisions on whether or not doing projects to generate monitoring income was a good strategy or not. And it's, it's a perfectly acceptable strategy. I mean, there's lots of the whole razor and razor blade uh, argument, right? Uh, that, that we hear a lot about. Mm, on the other hand, if you're, run, if you're in a business I'm running, I'm always going to demand that my projects be profitable and my monitoring be profitable. It's not an either or for me. I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Um, I have not seen any other Q&A questions come through. Um, is there anything else you'd like to touch up on, Joel, before we close out the webinar today? No, thanks for hosting it and um, uh, letting me speak. It's on one of my favorite subjects, which is helping companies run better businesses by better um, accounting systems. <laughs> no, it was a really great webinar, and I personally learned so much as well. Um, with that being said, if there are no further Q&A questions, oh, gotcha. Yes, yeah, so we will be um, sending out this uh, webinar. It will be uploaded to ESA's YouTube channel, so if you miss any portion of it, you'll be able to access it through there. Um, and we also will be sending out um, individual links as well um, as the Solutions 360 emails if you guys want to get in touch. Um, so there will be access uh, to that uh, for you guys. Um, with that being said, is there anything else? That's it. I'm just looking through over here and appreciate the kind words from our friends on the call that we actually uh, do consulting with. So thank you so much. <laughs> Yes. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joel and Max, uh, for your time today. Thank you to everybody who uh, joined and watched the webinar. Um, and hope I'm looking forward to hopefully doing another webinar with you guys soon. We'd love to do it. Awesome. Thank well, you. thank you, guys. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.